Hello, my name is Ari Javidan, and I'm the program coordinator for the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. Welcome to the latest presentation in the NCTRC webinar series. Today's session is on reimagining reimbursements, planning for sustainability for telehealth practice. Uh, today's webinar is hosted by the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center. These webinars are designed to provide timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs, and they are presented on the third Thursday of each month. Just as some background on the consortium, located throughout the country, there are 12 regional telehealth resource centers and two national, one focused on telehealth policy and the other on telehealth technology. Each serve as focal points for advancing the effective use of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. A few tips before we get started. Your audio has been muted. Please use the Q&A function of the Zoom platform to ask questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. Uh, please note that closed captioning is available and is located at the bottom of your screen. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will be able to access today's and past webinars on the NCTRC YouTube channel. With that, I will pass it over to Molly Brown, Director of the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center. Molly? Oh, Molly, I think you're still muted. I am. Thank you, Aria, and welcome everybody to today's presentation. I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Rochelle Martin is an attorney licensed in Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska, and is an outreach and education partner with the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center, serving Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma. Rochelle is a registered health information administrator, certified coder, who focuses on healthcare coding, billing, and reimbursements. She has practical experience with coding and billing issues, having worked in-house in healthcare administrative roles. She has served as an outpatient multi-specialty surgery coder, hospital-based outpatient coder, and a compliance coordinator for a large multi-specialty medical group. In addition, she has extensive HIPAA privacy and security and health information management experience. Her education includes a Juris Doctorate, as well as a Master's in Health Service Administration, not to mention numerous professional certifications. As an attorney, she advises clients proactively on complex reimbursement questions and has guided multiple clients through extensive Medicare and OIG audits and investigations. It's important to note that this presentation serves as education and information purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice. We're thrilled to have Rochelle with us today to inform on planning for sustainability through reimbursements for telehealth services. Now I will turn it over to Rochelle. Rochelle, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, and we can go on to the next slide. Next slide, please. Right, so uh, it's an absolute honor and a pleasure to, to be here with you to talk to you today uh, about planning for sustainability. And along that line, um, I always like to start out presentations with any new or emerging updates in the field of telehealth or legislation or policy or coding changes. And if you've been tracking telehealth and coding and billing and policy in your areas, you know there has been no shortage of those changes in the last couple of years. So one that I wanted to share with you just as an opening um, update as part of this session to illustrate what's happening um, right now at the federal level is just recently, uh, back in July, end of July the 28th, the House passed a bill, and again, this is this is just a bill at this point. It has not been um, finalized or passed into law yet. It is at the Senate waiting to be heard and to be passed. That would extend a lot of the telehealth flexibilities that we have come to uh, appreciate and use during the public health emergency through December 31st of 2024. Um, so it's just an illustration of some things that are going on rapidly, potentially changing the types of uh, telehealth services that we can provide, the way we provide it, how we get paid for them, and for how long, um, especially as we look forward to potentially, uh, knock on wood, hopefully at some point, a wind down of the federal public health emergency. You can go to the next slide, please. So I want to talk about today um, in terms of planning for sustainability in the delivery of telehealth services. The first thing I think of is financial sustainability. We can't continue to offer the services if we can't find a way 
to pay for them, uh, me meaning to have the resources, the technology resources and the staffing resources to provide those services. So I wanna talk just a little bit about what the telehealth landscape was in terms of um, restrictions under the Medicare program and the way telehealth was delivered in the pre-COVID era, which I now think of as an entire era prior to the announcement of the federal public health emergency. I then wanna look at just a, at a very high level, a summary of the types of flexibilities that were made available to providers and to patients during the federal public health emergency with respect to telehealth, the way it could be delivered, who can provide the telehealth services and how it was billed and paid during the public health emergency. As part of that, we have a case study to share with you on a behavioral health provider and what their particular um, telehealth environment looked at uh, looked like pre and during the COVID public health emergency, as well as what they're doing looking forward to plan for some of the changes that may come about as the public health emergency ends. So as we look at that case study, we'll talk a little bit about some tips on what you can do if you're thinking long-term, what, what factors you may take into consideration to make your telehealth delivery sustainable, primarily financially sustainable, uh, based on what we know on what's going to happen after the public health emergency ends. Next slide, please. So I want to start with what telehealth looked like pre-COVID. And I focus on the Medicare rules for reimbursement as kind of a national basis. And obviously, every state has different rules different policies under their state Medicaid programs for the way telehealth is delivered. And even outside of Medicaid, commercial payers and individual health plans varied significantly on how they handled telehealth services and payment for telehealth services. So I'm going to focus for purposes of today on that national Medicare standard so you can see how much has changed um, over the last couple of years. And before the federal public health emergency was announced, we had telehealth services as a covered and payable benefit under the Medicare program. But there were a lot of restrictions that made the delivery of telehealth very complicated, um, significantly restricted access to telehealth services and um, limited who could provide and who could bill for telehealth services. So, in the next couple of slides, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. We'll look at some of uh, look at what some of those restrictions were. There were geographic restrictions, and what I mean by this is that under the Social Security Act that was passed by Congress. Um, Medicare was, was prohibited from covering telehealth services outside of these geographic restrictions. They didn't have the flexibility through, through the rulemaking to make exceptions with very, very limited um, uh, circumstances. So for the vast majority of telehealth services to Medicare beneficiaries, the patient had to be geographically located in a rural healthcare provider shortage area or in a county that was outside of a metropolitan statistical area. Now, that's just a high level overview. There's very specific uh, criteria and parameters that determine whether or not the patient's location would fit into those geographic restrictions. But that's sort of the geography and the limitation that we were working under. Next slide, please. Prior to the public health emergency, there was site of service restrictions. And what I mean by that is the patient had to be located at an eligible originating site. So the patient in general had to present to a provider office, to a hospital, to a rural health clinic or an FH, uh, FQHC. With very, very limited exception, the patient could not be at home for a telehealth service to be delivered and paid for by Medicare. There were some very, very narrow exceptions, but for the most part, even in rural um, healthcare provider shortage areas, even in counties outside of metropolitan statistical areas, the patient had to physically present to these types of healthcare locations uh, to have a telehealth service delivered. And then a distant site provider was kind of remoting in to render that telehealth service to the patient. Next slide, please. 
Now, in terms of the distant site provider, the professional that's actually seeing the patient in a telehealth format, that was also limited. And the way that that language was, was worded under the Social Security Act is that it had to be a physician or a practitioner delivering a healthcare service. And, and the definitions of physician practitioners, um, of course, were, were MDs and DOs, uh, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, CRNAs. But what you don't see on this list are physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, uh, PT, OT, ST, uh, speech language pathologists, and a number of other types of healthcare professionals who enroll with Medicare and who can bill Medicare for their services, but who are not eligible to provide telehealth services. Next slide, please. We also had restrictions on the modality, the, the types of technologies that could be used to deliver a telehealth service. With very, very limited exception, a telehealth service would only be paid by Medicare if it was delivered in real time, meaning interactive like we are today, not email communications that were asynchronous, not portal communications, real time, two way, audio and visual communication. Um, so that last piece was also a significant limitation because if you think of audio visual, we could not have an audio only service. Um, a telephone call wouldn't count. A, a telehealth visit where there was no video component wouldn't count. If you think back to a couple of slides, another requirement prior to COVID was that the patient was in a rural geographic area. So a significant restriction was that in rural areas, the, the, the bandwidth, the technology, the ability to have both an audio and a visual component um, was very challenging in some places isn't, isn't technologically feasible to have enough bandwidth to do a video component for a telehealth service. Next slide, please. So then uh, we, we entered the COVID public health emergency era around March of 2020. And um, we had a number of flexibilities and waivers that kind of um, fixed, so to speak, some of those restrictions um, and made telehealth more accessible. And the flexibilities that Medicare started to implement really had the goal, had the policy purpose of trying to achieve increased access to healthcare services during that time, decrease unnecessary exposure between individuals. So um, certainly from an, an infection control perspective, trying to decrease sick contacts as much as possible during that time. And also to create some payment parity in the way telehealth services were delivered when they truly were replacing what would otherwise have been a face-to-face in-person service. Next slide, please. So a lot of those challenging restrictions that we saw in the Medicare um, telehealth payment policy prior to COVID were lifted and have been lifted, continue to be lifted during the federal public health emergency declaration. One of those added the patient's home as an eligible originating site, which has been huge. This allows the patient to be seen from their home um, or seen from uh, um, their, their residence rather than having to present physically to an eligible originating site location. Remember, those were locations like physician offices, hospitals, uh, FQHCs, RHCs, or community mental health centers. So achieving that goal of trying to reduce in-person contact, Medicare allowed the patient's home to be an eligible originating site for all Medicare telehealth services. Uh, Medicare also eliminated the requirement that the patient be in a rural geographic location. So that's a healthcare provider shortage area or an area, a county outside of a metropolitan statistical area. That made telehealth available to um, urban and suburban uh, and metropolitan communi 
communities that had never had access to telehealth services under Medicare before because of those geographic restriction requirements. And in fact, I was just seeing a report uh, last week from the Office of Inspector General uh, where they're doing a lot of studies on telehealth in the last couple of years, finding that um, individuals in urban and metropolitan areas were more likely to use telehealth services than individuals even in, in rural areas during the public health emergency. Um, it considerably broadened the scope of what services could be rendered as a telehealth service. Um, one of the other restrictions I, I should have mentioned in the pre-COVID era that continues now is that there is a list of codes, of billing codes, that Medicare will cover when they are delivered as a telehealth service. And that list grew um, by multiples during the public health emergency. Um, allowing many more services to be provided via telehealth that otherwise Medicare um, would require in-person visits for some of those billing, billing codes and billing services. Um, Medicare also expanded the list of providers who could serve as the distant site provider of a telehealth service. Remember that initial list of physician and physicians and practitioners didn't include the therapy disciplines of PT, an OT and, and speech language pathologist, but Medicare broadened that to say any provider, any professional who is enrolled in the Medicare program and who can bill for professional services could provide telehealth within their scope of practice so long as all other Medicare telehealth requirements were met. So that has been a huge expansion. And it, particularly in rural areas, one of the benefits of that expansion has allowed rural health clinics, federally qualified health centers, and critical access hospitals to serve as the distant site providers and billers of telehealth services, where before COVID, they could only serve as the originating site. So now in your critical access hospital, your rural health clinic, or your FQHC, if the patient is at home, those clinics, those provider types could deliver a telehealth service and bill for it as a distant site provider. And that was never an option prior to the public health emergency and these COVID waivers and flexibilities that we've had. Medicare also um, made flexible the audio visual two-way real-time um, interactive communication technology requirement and allowed certain services to be delivered as audio only. If you're interested in what those services are, it's not all covered telehealth services that can be rendered as audio only, but if you go to the Medicare physician fee schedule um, on the Medicare website, Website, you can pull up the list of codes that are covered as telehealth services right now during the public health emergency, and you'll see for each code an indication, a yes or a no, as to whether that individual service is allowed to be rendered as an audio-only service during the public health emergency. Another great benefit that has happened during the public health emergency is um, a, a flexibility in the provider supervision requirements. Um, when we have clinical staff or folks who would typically be billing for their services with a patient under the name of a, of a physician or a nurse practitioner, uh, Medicare calls that incident to billing. Right, so I think of in the in the in person office setting um, a blood pressure check, or checking in with the patient on um, anticoagulation management, and if they're having any signs or symptoms of inadequate control of anticoagulation therapy. Those types of service that might typically be done with a registered nurse um, get billed under the name and number of a nurse practitioner, a supervising APRN, or physician assistant, or physician. And when that happens in a normal environment, um, the, the supervising provider has to provide what's called direct supervision. They have to be physically in the office suite where that um, ancillary or auxiliary clinical staff person, like a registered nurse, is located and available to immediately intervene with that in-person face-to-face service. So during, uh, during COVID, when we have all of these telehealth flexibilities, 
uh, Medicare decided, you know, that that direct supervision requirement doesn't really fit telehealth. We may have a physician who needs to be at home quarantining because of an exposure or a positive COVID test, but who's otherwise well enough to help supervise or be available to intervene during a telehealth service or vice versa. The nurse may be at home for various reasons. And we don't want that to restrict the availability of telehealth services. So during the public health emergency, Medicare had allowed what they called virtual presence to satisfy the requirement of direct supervision. And virtual presence means as long as that supervising provider can't is available to intervene during the telehealth session, that was enough to follow to, to satisfy the supervision requirements. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about a case study of a behavioral health provider and what they were doing um, prior to COVID, what they sort of adapted as a little bit of a different work uh, workflow and care model during the COVID public health emergency to adapt to some of the telehealth uh, service flexibility offerings, and then what they're kind of projecting their services and their care line to look like after the public health emergency ends. Next slide, please. So let me give you a little bit of a background on what this provider, who they are and what they do. Um, I think their care model is really interesting. They're a provider group that specializes on mental and behavioral health. So they would have professionals like psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, um, et cetera, available to help primarily adults and, though, and, and seniors, individuals who may be on Medicare. And even more specialized, they focus on providing that mental and behavioral health expertise to skilled nursing facilities or other long-term long -term care environments. Those skilled nursing facilities or long-term care communities may have medical directors or a group of physicians and nurse practitioners, typically who are in general practice or internal medicine, come in to see their patients as the attending physician for the patient during their skilled stay, but who may not have um, the, the specialized expertise in dementia and Alzheimer's and other mental and behavioral health issues. Depression, certainly, during, um, during COVID-19. So that was the, the sort of gap, the specialty gap that this group helped Build. They would come in and provide mental and behavioral health services uh, for those individuals in the long-term care community. Now, they're contracted by the, the community. They are not employed by the long-term care uh, communities. Next slide, please. Prior to the COVID public health emergency, their care model by and large, um, as many of the care models were, really was face-to-face. -face. They did very little telehealth unless it was sort of an urgent, acute, or um, near emergent exacerbation of an individual's condition where they need access, needed access to a healthcare provider quickly. And depending on the location of the long-term care facility, if it was not in a rural geographic area, uh, this group may not have been able to receive compensation from Medicare for that telehealth visit, uh, trying to keep the patient out of a transfer to an acute care facility, but rather try to emerge, uh, manage that emergent or urgent exacerbation there within the community. So they would primarily physically go on site um, see the residents in those long-term care communities, work with the physicians, work with the nurse practitioners and interdisciplinary groups within the communities on the patient's mental and behavioral health care needs. Um, everything from depression screening to medication management and, and um, other coordination within the community. So the disadvantage of that is requiring extra time and labor and resources for those healthcare professionals to physically travel to a number of different long-term care communities within their you know, geographic reach. Um, certainly then reducing the number of individuals that they could see and serve because of all of that travel time. And again, telehealth pre-COVID was limited I should say payment for telehealth was limited to individuals and facilities that were in rural geographic areas. At the 
um, at the facility itself, if a telehealth visit was rendered, which was more of the exception than the norm, it was the facility staff like a nurse aide or an LPN who would present the patient to this mental and behavioral health care provider acting as a distant site telehealth provider for the service. Next slide, please. When you think about uh, March through May, uh, maybe even longer of 2020, um, you remember that the access into long-term care communities was significantly limited at that time, right? They went on lockdown in a lot of cases and um, access even among healthcare providers coming into the community that was not absolutely necessary was severely restricted, um, even to many of these third party providers. And this mental behavioral health care group then was really at the mercy of each individual's facility on what they were allowing in terms of, um, I, I wouldn't really call them visitors, but non-employed care staff coming into the community and having access to their employees, to um, their residents, in an effort to reduce contacts and try to control the spread of the virus. Uh, the clinicians themselves within this mental and behavioral health care group were actually reluctant to go into those long-term care communities because of the perceived risk of uh, an increased risk of the spread of infection contained within that uh, facility environment. At the same time, and we know this is still an issue several years later, the staffing levels in those long-term care communities were severely strained, um, really reducing the availability of the nursing facility staff, like a nurse aide or an LPN, to present these patients to the mental and behavioral health group um, in order to render a telehealth service. Next slide, please. So what they did to adapt to those challenges that came about during uh, the, the early stages of COVID, um, really watching and following and being aware of some of the enhanced Medicare reimbursement opportunities in the mental and behavioral health care space. Um, some of those were available even outside of the COVID uh, public health emergencies, but because of COVID, because of those challenges and access to the residents and the communities, really forced this provider group to think critically about what service options were currently out there to enable them to see patients in a way with, with their um, patient access restrictions that they were working under and to take care of their residents continue a good quality of care, and yet at the same time, help have a little bit of compensation reimbursement um, to pay their providers and to continue to, to meet those patient needs, uh, a sustainable model, if you will. So one or two of the programs that they looked at were already options even outside of the COVID public health emergency. And they're programs similar to what you may have already seen called chronic care management under the Medicare program. And over the last several years, Medicare has taken that concept of managing patients' chronic conditions in a way that it's not necessarily a direct face-to-face -face service, but it's also not a telehealth service because you're not live um, audio visual two way real time. It's more of a behind the scenes management of the patient's care plan and of the patient's medications. And Medicare has expanded that concept into the mental and behavioral health world to create options called behavioral health integration and psychiatric collaborative care, where you have providers just like this provider group who have um, expertise and experience specifically on mental and behavioral health conditions and coordinate that component of the patient's care with medical providers that are handling other medical conditions and chronic or acute conditions for the patient. And there are separate billing codes for behavioral health integration and psychiatric collaborative care. These are non-face-to-face, -face, which is exactly what this provider group needed because their face-to-face in-person access was significantly restricted. Um, the, the group created what they called a social worker liaison who would go into the community to alleviate that burden on the facility staff who were just doing everything they could with the resources they had to take care of the patients at that time. And so to alleviate that burden, 
to not require the facility's CNA or LPN to present the patient. Um, and he had a social worker liaison go into the community to help present the patient for the distant site um, psychiatrist, psychologist, or other um, mental or behavioral health care professional. The benefit is that social worker in the room was kind of the behavioral health mental and behavioral health eyes and ears really seeing that patient in person real time who could also help communicate to the distant site provider, but also then go back to the facility staff and live real time coordinate with their clinical staff with physicians and nurse practitioners taking care of other conditions to best manage the mental and behavioral health component of that patient's care. So then that on-site staff, as I said, they're really the eyes and ears during that session, a trained person who can even add an enhanced value to those telehealth services. Next slide, please. So the results that they saw as they adapted to um, the, the telehealth flexibilities, uh, the ability to see patients outside of geographic areas, to have social workers and other staff who um, typically would not be able to render a telehealth service under normal rules, but with broadened um, flexibilities, were able to do that on top of creating a more comprehensive behavioral health integration care model based on existing Medicare um, programs that are available uh, even before the COVID, health, uh, COVID public health emergency came about. They saw some great benefits uh, for the care that they were able to provide to patients. Decreased visit wait times. Um, and that's kind of twofold. First, decreased time to actually have a, a visit with a provider when you have a need, right? Uh, if you call your healthcare provider today, you might get in next week. It might be a couple of weeks. It could be a couple of months. But because their providers were not physically traveling to all of those locations, that travel time was saved. And they could see more patients in a day um, without compromising the quality of care. And so that allowed patients to get scheduled quicker when they're starting to have exhibit some behaviors or exhibit some signs that maybe medications weren't properly or adequately, I should say, managed, get in with a healthcare provider that specializes in mental and behavioral health to intervene quicker before those became more severe problems. And, um, it, you know, the trickle down effect of that is reduced readmissions or transfers back to acute care facilities, reduced complications in other areas, uh, better coordination of care. So that on-site social worker liaison is uh, is really there to talk to the facility staff rather than simply having the distance site provider add a report to the chart. There's a conversation happening among a behavioral or mental health provider and the facility staff um, right after the telehealth visit. So those interventions can go into effect immediately. Patients were happier. They're happy because uh, they can get a visit with mental and behavioral health providers quicker, with specialized providers. Um, their needs are managed quicker. The signs and symptoms are managed quicker. And uh, sort of a, a soft, I think, a fuzzy patient satisfaction factor is that during that time when the facilities were locked down and there's not a lot of visitors coming into the long-term care communities, it was just another opportunity, I wouldn't say for socialization, but for human interaction um, between that, that resident and a healthcare provider, you know, that's in the outside world, outside of that long-term care community. And by doing this and by looking at um, existing care models like behavioral health integration, psychiatric collaborative care that they're working into their telehealth visits, this provider group has developed a model that's going to be sustainable after the public health emergency ends because those codes, those services will continue to be available even after the flexibilities from the public health emergency with respect to telehealth go away. Um, now what they're looking at for kind of the post COVID public health emergency is really incorporating all of those concepts being able to go back into the communities in person to have their visits face-to-face -face with the patient when that's needed and when that's appropriate, but also having available telehealth services and this comprehensive 
sort of chronic care behavioral health integration model that can go on behind the scenes and address conditions in between face-to-face -face visits, whether that's telehealth or in person, to keep that patient um, stable with all of the mental and behavioral conditions that are being managed. Next slide, please. So with that example, I want to talk a little bit about um, the path moving forward, things that are happening kind of at the federal level. And if you're looking at what you can do, similar to this behavioral health care group, um, to make your telehealth services accessible and financially sustainable when some of these flexibilities go away, we'll talk about some tips for how you can do that. Next slide, please. So I strongly encourage you to go through the exercise that this provider group did and look at the coding and the billing and the payment options under Medicare, under your commercial payer agreements, under your state Medicare program to understand what's already out there. What was available prior to the public health emergency that we may not have been fully tapping into? Chronic care management, whether or not that's behavioral health care management, but just regular chronic care management of patients and other non-face-to-face services. If you're looking for that, a good um, search term to use is, um, is uh, care, care management services under the Medicare program. It's an entire benefit, uh, a, a whole group of services that are not telehealth, but they're not also not in-person face-to-face services. And these services can be provided to patients, um, you know, in between those telehealth or in between those in-person visits to really manage them behind the scenes. A lot of these are already available. They're options that you could consider. And many times I, when I talk with providers, they say, gosh, we're already doing a lot of those things. Um, we may need to add, uh, add a few workflows. We may, do, may need to improve our documentation to support that particular billing code, but we're doing a lot of that work already. So let's capture it in an organized program and be reimbursed for the services, the benefits that Medicare already offers. Um, I encourage you to take a look at what you've done during the COVID public health emergency. What changes have you made and which of those changes were based on flexibilities under the public health emergency? So um, an example of that is some uh, practices that have adopted um, a, a flexible work model for nurses, allowing them to flex and work from home periodically because they can have telehealth visits with patients, and right now that would be, uh, that could potentially be a covered telehealth benefit, um, assuming you've got the appropriate level of provider supervision. Some of those models may be going away when the option to have virtual presence during a telehealth visit versus physically on site direct supervision by that uh, supervising provider, if that flexibility goes away. And based on what we're seeing in the Medicare proposals right now, the plan is for that virtual presence supervision to go away. But at the same time, being aware that there are a lot of legislative changes happening at the state and the federal level, trying to take these flexibilities and make them permanent, or at the very minimum, extend them. Um, earlier this year, late March, I want to say it was March 29th or around that time frame, um, as part of the annual Consolidated Appropriations Act, um, we had Congress extend a lot of telehealth flexibilities, but not all of them, um, for an additional calendar year. And so that's a great flexibility to give us time um, for 151 days after the public health emergency ends, a lot of those flexibilities would continue to be in effect. So every 90 days when the PHE renewal comes up, we're kind of watching and waiting to see if it gets renewed um, because we know that gives us 90 days of the next renewal and then 151 days afterwards that so we still have those, those certain um, uh, COVID telehealth flexibilities in place. And then, as I mentioned, late summer at the end of July, we had another bill passed the House, 
has yet to be heard in the Senate, um, that if it were passed by the Senate and if it became law, it would extend many of those um, telehealth flexibilities even further through the end of 2024. So that's one that we want to be watching through the end of this year. And you have many state bills and flexibilities and waivers happening with respect to provider licensing and Medicare coverage of telehealth services and state legislatures changing um, the way telehealth is defined under their state laws also. We're seeing states enact um, restrictions on the kind of big national telehealth groups and whether they can provide telehealth services to individuals in the state and if so, how. So lots of changes are happening on a regular basis. Um, understanding what changes, what flexibility and rules you're currently operating under and understand which of those flexibilities may go away that impact your model will be really important. Understanding too, um, we're kind of on a, a, a ticking timer here for when the public health emergency may end. And there are some flexibilities that will go away the day that the federal public health emergency ends. For example, one of those, at least as we sit here today and the rules that we're working under today, is that critical access hospitals would no longer be able to serve as distant site providers of telehealth services under the Medicare program. That goes away the day the public health emergency ends. But there are other flexibilities that would continue to be available, like uh, um, the patient's home as an eligible originating site that would continue to be available for 151 days after the public health emergency ends. So knowing kind of when those flexibilities would go away for you and being able to pivot and shift in time when they do go away um, to accommodate whatever the rules for telehealth are at that point in time will be important. And I said, I can't emphasize enough, keeping an eye on legislation, whether that's through your local um, uh, telehealth resource center. Um, I subscribe to legislative updates uh, in the different states that I work in so that I get notices if there are statutory or regulatory changes in those states. Subscribing to your Medicaid programs updates on policy bulletins so you can keep an eye for anything telehealth related and even your commercial payer contracts, making sure you're checking those monthly policy bulletins. I've been seeing more and more of those in our um, geographic area for commercial payers changing their telehealth policy or maybe uh, rolling back some some of the cost sharing waivers for telehealth services that had been in effect during the COVID public health emergency. We're also seeing a lot of changes in the way telehealth services are actually coded and billed when you're submitting those claims for reimbursement. So there will be no shortage, uh, I think, of, of changes in the telehealth world res with respect to the way they're delivered, the way they're coded, the way they're reported on the claim, and ultimately how they get paid over the next couple of years. So keep your eyes and ears on it. Um, I think it's going to be a, a challenging, but an exciting time in the world of telehealth moving forward. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, Rochelle. Now we can open it up to some questions. If you have them, you can type them in the Q&A box at the bottom. We did have one come in, Rochelle, that um, I indicated we would I'd bring up when you were finished. Um, we do have a participant that was wondering if you could um, clarify the name of the bill that does extend flexibilities to December 2024, um, possibly where to also find it. Sure. And Oh, sorry, Molly. I think I've got a leak on the slides here. If we end up sending the slides out to those attending, if not, um, I, I don't. We can go back to that. I think was the third slide in the deck. If we can navigate to that one. There we go. Yes, I see it. So it's the link at the bottom. Um, I believe we can, I'll, I'll uh, coordinate with Aria to see if we can get this sent out. And while we're on that um, topic, if you click on the link here, it's going to do two things. It will take you to a link 
um, to the text of the bill <clears throat> to take a look at. And um, it also something that I think is kind of interesting. Uh, there was a rules committee meeting discussing the bill on whether to pass it, why or why not. And I thought that conversation um, among Congress was really interesting. There is a lot of interest in making these provisions permanent, but their hesitation to do that was they just didn't feel like they had enough data yet. So I see this as sort of a bridge piece of legislation that while Congress studies in particular the, the program integrity risks related to telehealth, um, that there's still the possibility that these flexibilities become permanent at some point. The other piece that I think is important, it was passed by the House um, in July, so it moved to the Senate to be considered. The impression of, you know, this is all kind of predicting at this point, but the impression is um, that that's likely to wait until after midterms before the Senate considers this bill and determines whether to pass it or not. So we may be looking at an alert couple of months before we see any action one way or another. Okay, so I have one uh, comment that then leads into uh, a question. So one participant indicates that in their investigations, they discovered that claims to bill for our provider's time could be rejected by payers due to how provider roles are set up by MCOs as CMS does not recognize pediatric emergency medicine roles. They are requesting this be a telemedicine specialty code where each modifier could reimburse for a different specialty like the U1 and U2 do for the 95999. Question is, they are looking for suggestions on other mechanisms besides state CMS offices where they have submitted several times in the last 18 months these requests as they are very overwhelmed to help address this problem. Do you have other recommendations, Rochelle, to make suggestions for specialty codes and um, adopting different modifiers? Yeah, I wanna read this question too, because that's a great question. I wanna make sure I'm addressing the piece on um, claims to bill for the provider's time could be rejected due to the specialty rule, if I'm understanding that correctly. Uh, so I take that to mean the specialty taxonomy that that provider is enrolled under, under the Medicare program and then under the MCO, the uh, Medicare Advantage programs. So uh, correct me if I'm, if I'm understanding that incorrectly. And I think that's a really good question. Uh, this year in the, the Medicare physician fee schedule, the proposed rule that has not yet been finalized but that once finalized will go into effect January 1 of 2023, spends a lot of time talking about provider specialties and how that impacts billing. And under the traditional kind of fee-for-service Medicare program, uh, Medicare has a very limited number of specialties that they recognize on the provider's 855 enrollment. Um, I was working with an orthopedic group a few weeks ago, and even among their orthopedic group, there were subspecialties that Medicare just simply doesn't recognize. So where that, and I'm, I'm kind of re trying to read between the lines here. So if I'm misunderstanding the question, please let me know. Um, when you've got specialties that are subspecialties that are not recognized by the payer, those subspecialties time can get denied or rejected, particularly when it's being reported on the same day as another provider of the same primary specialty designation in the same group practice that's being rendered to that patient and reported to the payer. So there are there are a couple of things there. Um, one, um, I would encourage you to pull up the Medicare physician fee schedule and the proposed rule. It's in the federal register and it's available on the CMS website. And at the beginning of that federal register publication, there's different individuals at CMS that you can contact with exactly these types of questions. And I've had great luck um, with those folks responding in the past. Sometimes it takes a few days or a few weeks, of course, but I almost always do get a response on those types of questions. Um, the second thing that I'm that I'm thinking of, if I'm understanding that scenario co correctly of where the, the subspecialties provider's time or billing code may get um, denied 
because it's reported on the same day as another provider in the same primary specialty in the same group practice for Medicare or the NCO, uh, is that when that happens and you've got multiple providers, if you look at the Medicare guidelines and the Medicare manual, um, there are some provisions on being able to combine their time and their work in determining the level of service. And in some instances, uh, you may even have um, prolonged service or add-on codes that could potentially be available based on their combined work. So those would be the two suggestions just off the top of my head that you might look into. Thank you. We have quite a few questionings com questions coming in. I will make this announcement for the greater good. We are documenting each question. And one of the things that we can do is then pose them to Rochelle after the webinar and then give it as sort of a handout for good resources and answers to your questions if we don't get to it. Another question that came in is, do you have information on FQHC reimbursements for telehealth and if it will still be at the reduced rate? Currently, it is not the PPS rate. Okay, so I may need some more information on this question, but the thing that comes to mind when it when it says uh, reimbursement for telehealth, um, may need some information on whether they're asking about the originating site fee for the FQHC, which is not the PPS rate. It's a lower rate of reimbursement when the patient's presenting to the FQHC for the telehealth service, and it's being rendered by a distant site provider at another location. Um, if we're talking about the FQHC's distant site provider, now that with our current flexibilities, and as we stand today, um, FQHCs could continue to bill as a distant site provider of telehealth under Medicare for 151 days after the PHE ends. If that's the piece that they're referring to, I'll have to do some research on that to see um, where that reduction may be coming from. We have quite a few questions coming in and I'm trying to be mindful. Um, do you think they will extend the PHG in October? Oh gosh, you know, um, I, I, I laugh at having to predict because as Molly knows, we had a session uh, for HTRC last July. And all signs and indications to me pointed to um, one more renewal, and that was the end. And here we are, 14 months later, still in the federal public health emergency. Um, I will say they, there. I don't know about October. Um, I'm trying to think of the exact date in October. We should have 90 to 60 days advance notice prior to allowing the PHE to expire. So my inclination based on that is that it is likely to be renewed for another 90 day period. And I'm saying that because although it's not binding and you know, the HHS could decide to do whatever um, uh, the secretary can decide to do something different, They've made a commitment to try to let the states and others know at least 60 days in advance of when they plan to let the public health emergency expire for a lot of these reasons, because there are still flexibilities and rules that will go away the day the PAG ends. And they have been, del at, at, at the onset of the public health emergency, we would know about a week ahead of time that they were going to renew it. They were making that decision pretty far in advance. And the last several times, it has been the afternoon of the day that the PHE has expired. I mean, really feels like a nail biter that they announced that they're renewing it. Um, so because we haven't had that notification of an intent to allow it to expire next, uh, next month, excuse me, my best guess um, would be that it is likely to renew in October for another 90 day period. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we are getting towards the end and I will be turning it back over to Aria. I will note if you would like to um, continue the conversation and ask additional questions, you can uh, um, email the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center at htrc at kumc.edu. It is on the screen right now. We will be, we did document all of the questions. We will be sending those over to Rochelle and she can add um, some helpful information and then we can supply it to Aria 
and the National Consortium for as a resource as well. So we will be um, working on this. So we, please be patient with us. Let me double check there aren't any more. I will turn it over to Aria. Thank you again, Rochelle. I appreciate your time. And as always, great job. Absolutely. Thank you, Molly. And thank you, Rochelle. Uh, just a reminder that our next webinar will be held on Thursday, October 20th, and that will be hosted by the Southeast Telehealth Resource Center. Uh, registration information will be posted soon on the NCTRC website. Uh, and then lastly, we do ask that you take a few short minutes to complete the survey that will pop up at the conclusion of this webinar. Your feedback is very valuable to us. Uh, thank you again to Rochelle for the presentation and to the Heartland Telehealth Resource Center for hosting today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.